I'm here with writer-director Julio Quintana, uh, whose latest film, Blue Miracle, is now streaming on Netflix. And joining me is uh, my right-hand man, Mr. David Fowley of Keeping It Real, the one and the only. So we are going to talk about some movies tonight. We're very excited, uh, Julio, that you could uh, join us. And so let's talk Blue Miracle. How are you doing, first of all? I'm doing great, man. I actually, uh, yeah, I'm here in Austin, Texas, I guess just, just outside of Austin, Texas, and with my three kids and my wife, and uh, doing pretty good. We got just swimming in the pool. Wow. It's possible, yeah. <clears throat> it's hot. It's very hot. It's very hot. Actually, my AC went out three days ago. Oh, no. And, no. and uh, with all the Californians moving here, it's hard to find people to work, work on stuff. There's so many new, new construction and all that stuff. So it's okay. We're all right. It's, uh, it's, there's a fan on right now above me. I don't know how this I'm messing up the sound, but it's, uh, it's no. pretty hot. It's pretty I hot. Can't hear I it. don't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> let's talk about Blue Miracle. This is your second feature uh, after The Vessel from 2016, right? Yeah. Now, they're very <clears throat> different kinds of films. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One is uh, more of an, an art house, uh, you know, adult targeted kind of a, a spiritual meditation. And the second one is very much more of for lesser uh, lesser term a uh, family film but also with that that's kind of spiritual through line both involve uh boats <laughs> both involve uh nails in various mm. uh, various capacities so right. in going from one the first film to the second uh what attracted you to this idea of sort of switching up genres but maintaining that thematic through line well i think so when I made, when I made the vessel, that was, that was my first feature, and, and it was that was that was me that was me sort of experimenting, finding my voice, doing doing something that I was really personal and experimental. And those are all themes and imagery that that meant stuff to me. <clears throat> um, and so, but but you know, the movie was a small it was a small release. It was you know it was difficult to buy groceries off of the money I made on that one and stuff. And so so then it was it was sort of like okay like. I, I, what I what I realized was like I made exactly the movie I wanted to make, but it I think, but I think some of the things, some of the choices I made, it's like people didn't, it's like people couldn't tell if I had made those as a choice or because I just didn't know how to make a movie or something, and you know, and it was sort of it was sort of like the question was like I made even my own family they're like how come you never like how come you have didn't, they didn't talk ever why you know how come, could could you could you do comedy could you make jokes I mean could you do this stuff and I was like. I'm pretty sure I could do that stuff if I felt like it, you know? And so, so when this movie was brought to me, it wasn't my original concept, it was based on a, a, a true event. And I was kind of like, you know, it was, it felt like an interesting challenge. Like they, they wanted, you know, they were trying to put it in that sort of Mighty Ducks kind of world, the Bad News Bears sort of thing. And there are movies that I liked as a kid that I don't watch now. I, I still don't watch them. I didn't watch any of those to, to do this. <clears throat> but it seemed like an interesting challenge to myself to see like, okay, I did, I did, the really exper experimental thing. Could I do something that my grandma would like and, and, and in a way that it still somehow kind of has my aesthetic uh, in some ways? And, and I, so I kind of took it as like a challenge and, and an experiment. And, and it was fine. It actually worked out how I had expected. It was like, yeah, to me, it's like, it's a much easier genre to work in, um, obviously, because it's, it's, you have, shredded territory that you kind of know things that work and don't work from you know the vessel was like I, you're just making up every moment as you go which is so it's a, that's more of a tightrope so this was this was this was more of a uh, an experiment to see can't whereas in the vessel it was like I wanted to make people feel ask questions and not know exactly how to feel in the end like could I do the other thing the more Spielberg -y thing where you you try to make people feel a certain thing at, at any given moment and you it just works and I, and I and so I learned that I can do that I learned that I can make people feel a certain way at a certain moment and uh and I can wrap it up in a way that's satisfying and so so now I feel like I've touched like two I'm like walking kind of walking down a creative hallway and I've touched both sides of the wall and now I'm kind of finding the way in the middle here where I'm like okay that wasn't the most satisfying thing creatively I could ever do uh but it got a billion views of whatever you know um uh and so that's nice in its own way but but I think now it's kind of it's like, okay, now how do I integrate those two approaches into something that's like, uh, that I, I truly a billion percent care about, and, but is accessible and, and, you know, to a broader audience. Cause, <clears throat> and so that's kind of how it came about. I think the, 
I think the imagery that goes through the middle of it is just sort of a result of my kind of spiritual religious background that's uh, I did religious studies in college. I was, you know, I was very religious growing up. I did religious studies, secular religious studies in, in college. And so I'm really interested in mythology and symbolism and uh, magical realism, all those things. Uh, not in any real kind of literal way. I, I wouldn't, I don't ascribe to a particular uh, faith uh, really, but um, that imagery seems to permeate everything I do in weird ways. So, um, so yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a challenge, like putting weird, water dreams and like a sports family sports movie but they let me do it and uh and that's the stuff i like the best probably in in the movie the stuff that's the most me i think um so yeah that's that's how that that's how that kind of came about well to follow up on all that my first question is did your grandmother wind up liking it my grandma First thing she told me, she reminded me how much she didn't like the vessel. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, so, and she said, I officially, she's like, you are, you graduated. You, you are officially a, a, a director. And she's an old Cuban lady. Like they don't mess around man. they just tell it to you exactly how they feel. So uh, yeah, she, she, uh, she watched this one three times and she, she really liked it. So, so there's something, there's something to that. There's something to, I think it's like the kind of thing that people needed right at this particular moment in the world. Uh, it seems like people had, I, I feel like I had a pretty decent 2020, but a lot of people didn't. And I, you know, and, uh, and they seem to kind of appreciate something that's sort of sincere and, and heartfelt and uplifting. So, um, so yeah, so in that sense, I think it's like, I'm, I'm glad that uh, if I made somebody's day uh, or 20 million people's day or whatever it ended up being, uh, you know, that's great. Um, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I can feel good about that, but I, I don't, I probably won't do the same thing again. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of exploring. So, yeah. now did you um, did you finish the film in 2020, or was it kind of in the can before the pandemic started? Was there post production, or tell me about it that? It was in it was in the can at the end of 2019, and so I was in post in 2020, and so we finished editing kind of first quarter of 2020, and but the movie was supposed to be a theatrical release, um, and then of course that didn't happen. So so they we kind of sat on the movie uh, for three or four months waiting for it to, for theaters to open up again. And when that, I basically tenant, you know, clear, uh, solidified that that was never gonna happen. And so, uh, so then we moved on to the streamers and Netflix, um, they loved it and they, they got behind it. And, you know, it was like, the, I, I don't know how many times I heard that same story from like, you know, every Hollywood reporter round table, they're all like, oh, we didn't know what we're gonna do. And Netflix swooped in and they, you know, they, but so that's like every, every movie last year, that's what, that's what happened. It seems like, but we were really happy about it. Netflix was really happy with it. And so, um, in the end, it felt like it, it actually felt like a good match because because of the reach that Netflix had and people weren't going it out. Uh, it seemed like, and they wanted to watch it with their kids and stuff. So it seemed like it actually ended up working out better better than probably than we expected. So, yeah. You, you mentioned uh, in the, I guess you're pertaining to the writing process when you mentioned this. You mentioned that. Uh, you know, they let me do this, you know, as far as kind of the backstory with uh, uh, Papa Omar um, that you're alluding to throughout the movie. Um, are you referring to they, the studio, the producers, or, you know, when, when you're incorporating that, what, who are you getting approval from? Well, it was, it was made by, it, it was financed by Endeavor Content and Sony Provident. And so, you know, that was, that was another big thing was in the vessel, it was just me and my wife, my wife was yep. a producer. And, and so I got to do pretty much, I just left to Puerto Rico with money in an account and we made whatever I felt like making. And this was, you know, you have seven, eight people. If you want to add clouds to a sky or something, you got to get like eight people to sign off on it or whatever. And so it's, uh, so this was sort of like my first experience of doing like an adult, you know, professional setting where you just have, you have studio executives and different people have to sign off on stuff. And, uh, and it was okay. I, like, I, you know, that's, that's not like super fun as a creative, you know, that's not the funnest part, but, but it was a good training ground for like, like now I know how to convince people of something. And, and like, that's, that is the job. I, and, and in effect, like, <clears throat> I think it's it, what it, the, the impression I'm getting is like kind of the higher up you go in budget level, the more critical it is to be able to co convince people of your ideas and, and be able to articulate them in a way that's, that makes sense, sense to the people who, with checks so so i came out of this experience much better at that process of of being able to articulate what i need why i need it and uh and in the end they you know i basically did everything i mean i was also trying to make i, I was trying to make exactly the movie that 
you saw, you know, that was those, that was the intention. So in the end, I, I, I did do what I tried to do uh, and, and everybody was very supportive, um, but it's a process that's different from indie filmmaking. So. Now you mentioned um, <clears throat> after, after the vessel came out, you said you, you made almost enough money to buy some groceries with what you made off of it, right? So in that sense, was it difficult to go from that movie doing what it did to getting a shot to do this this bigger movie? Did you have to really sell it or was it difficult to get in that next room? Well, you know, I think it was, I mean, I can only go off of like my instinct of why it happened. I think when they brought it to me, I think it was, I think maybe they thought it was gonna be a little bit lower budget than what it ended up being. But it was also like, originally when they brought it to me, it was, it was like really heavy, sort of like in the faith space genre, um, which is not, it's just frankly not the kind of genre that attracts big talent uh, to, make, to make those sorts of things. So, <clears throat> um, and so I think it actually didn't get, it wasn't difficult to get, them to approve me to do this for and i could not figure out why i was like if you saw the vessel like how could you possibly think i could do this movie <laughs> uh but for some reason they 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 all signed off on it and uh and it was good and so i i did a lot of script revisions on the script and uh early on and then so i think that gave them confidence that uh that i i knew at least i knew how to do mainstream cinema and stuff and uh, yeah, it was weird. I, I, I don't actually know why they let me do it. I, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, other than I had like a strong visual style, you know, and I can get good performances. Like you can look at the vessel and see that, but it doesn't, but it, you know, anybody who watched the vessel would think I had no sense of humor, for example. So like, how could I make kids joking around on a boat and stuff? So, um, so no, it was, it was, I, I feel really grateful that they just kind of took a risk on me. And, and I think it took, I think it probably took a couple weeks. And once they started seeing the dailies, then they, I think they really, they realized that I, was doing it right, you know? So, um, but but uh, yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a surprise. And most of the people in my life, they're like, you're doing what movie? What is, what is this? What is it? And I'm like, I don't know, man, it could be fun. Maybe we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's just fun. tell him Dennis Quaid, leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, how did you hook up with co-writer Chris Dowling? Well, Chris was already, like he had the script. And, uh, and so he had written the script for these guys. They had hired him to do it. And so when they brought it to me, um, they already had a screenplay and Chris, uh, he was already, like, he was, he, he had another, his own movie, I think, Run, Run the Race, uh, I think it was in theaters or something. So he was, because he's a director in his own right. So he, he was already moving on to other things. And I was like, look, they, I can I re I'm realizing now that I kind of need to wrestle with the material myself if I'm going to direct it to kind of get, to figure out what's going on beneath the, all the surface. And so, so I was just like, look, why don't I just, I'll take a pass at it and I'll mess with it for a couple weeks and so, just to kind of get my head wrapped around this thing. And then, and then I just kind of kept going and kept going and kept going. And then the movie got bumped because so we had Dennis. Oh, Dennis was who they wanted for the film. And then he got pushed off on Goliath, the Amazon show. Yeah. So then our movie got bumped several months. So then I just like, just kind of messing and tinkering. And uh, so by the time he came back around to being available, I had already, I had done quite a bit of revisions and kind of made it my own. And so, um, so yeah, that's how I knew Chris. And, and Chris is a great guy and I, um, and we still are in touch and stuff, but I, uh, but it wasn't like we co-wrote it together. It was like, I, I got a writing credit after for doing revisions. This is how it worked. Okay. So, <laughs> so tell me about these. Uh, well, first of all, were you familiar with the story uh, when you got the script? And the changes that you made were those to bring it more in line with the with the real events? Were you trying to move away from the real events? What, what, was, what were those revisions like? And, and what, let's just, let's, for those who might not be familiar, who haven't probably watched the movie yet, and are for some reason listening to this conversation, having not watched the movie, <laughs> um, let's set this up. It's, uh, there's an orphanage in, uh, in Cabo. It's in danger of being uh, shut down by the bank. And there's this uh, world famous uh, fishing competition. Um, and uh, Papa Omar, who runs, you know, co-runs the orphanage, uh, hooks up with this kind of crusty sea captain who's won the competition before to go out and, and get the biggest marlin. And, you know, the rest of the movie kind of unfolds from there. And it's based on a true story. So tell me about this, the initial version of this story. Uh, how close was it to the real events and how much was creative license and what was your input in, in crafting the story? Uh, yeah, I did not know anything about it until it was brought to me. 
uh, I would say I'm, it feels like to me like uh, I think Chris's script was probably more accurate, like more true to the real events uh, in the sense that, like I said, it was it was a pretty explicitly faith film, and, um, and the real Omar, who I, I flew down there and I interviewed him, he was much more of a like he's he's like his faith is like the reason he does this, and and he he. He like as soon as he heard about the tournament, he just knew they were gonna win it, and he got into it. He just how to you know, and it was it was stuff that was like, it, it, it just kind of stretches credit believability, you know, um, in some ways. So so for me, it was just it, for me, it wasn't there was like no room for a dramatic arc with a guy who like thinks he's gonna win a tournament and then goes and wins the tournament. So <clears throat> so I actually so the I, the creative license I took, like for example, I. Well, I gave him, I gave the dead father backstory and all those dreams. The, there were some dreams in there, but not about a dead father or anything. Uh, I gave, well, the, the, the I, I don't know if somebody's listening to this about watching the movie. I don't really know. But okay, fine. But then, but, you know, like Captain Wade's, like uh, the, the, the kind of his secret uh, about the previous tournaments, like that was the thing I added. Uh, his wife in Dallas. Um, all, all that, so that whole subplot, everything that was all stuff I added. Um, like Captain Wade was just sort of like a, that was part of the note when they brought it to me was they wanted him to be a bigger character so they could get somebody like Dennis to play that role. And so I, you know, I, I so I made, I made him like this, I, I, the whole, the whole question about like fatherhood. Uh, I th I'm Chris, I'm sure Chris had themes, the elements of that in the script, if it's just been so long, but I, I, I brought up, like I, I created the whole debate about what kids need, whether it's a guy who, you know, a dad who wins trophies or a dad who's always there or whatever. So, um, so all those things I brought to the forefront that I had not, I don't, I didn't get that from the real Omar, um, but it's built into the thing is like those things, these are things that are thematically built into the sport itself. So like the thing about a fishing movie is like, you can't, you can't do the montage where they get better and they all, you know, they inevitably went, there's an element of chance to it. So that kind of like faith is like baked into, you have to believe that you're actually going to, you know, so, so, so that, so the, the, the sport itself kind of lends itself to the faith elements in a, in a way that's sort of organic. And the fact that it was an orphanage, a guy with a bunch of young uh, uh, orphans lent itself to questions about fatherhood. So, so the actual real event, I, cr I crafted the themes and I expanded the themes based on the real things that I, that I was handed, you know, the real elements. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so I would say that it, I took, I, yeah, I took more creative license than was in the original script to, for the, for the drama, you know? Mm. So are, are, on that note, are you, um, with a story like this, are you, I'm just wondering in general, are, are filmmakers obligated to start a movie like this, like based on a true story? Or, you know, I'm just wondering. I don't know, like, I don't know if we're obligated. I mean, I think that's a, it's a very powerful tool for people. So it's like people want to see a true story. And so, so, so no, I, yeah, I, I would, I mean, for us, it was only beneficial to, for the fact that it was a true story. Um, I think that, you know, like I, I will say that the things that I tried, what I really tried to do is because there, you know, there really was a storm, they really did destroy, they really hit their orphanage, they really only had a few weeks of food, all that stuff's real. They, um, <clears throat> the Bisbee's really did let them into the tournament uh, that year in particular, all, all that stuff. But, but so, so, but the thing is, like, he, so I talked to Omar, and I get he tells me how he felt in that time. He felt alone. He felt like he didn't know what he was going to do. He didn't, and so you gotta like you have to adapt the drama to make the audience feel what Omar felt, mm -hmm. you know. So even if the events aren't exactly what Omar was dealing with, you just you have to you have to you have to heighten them a bit to make the audience feel how he. So I I try to stay true to how he felt the the, the pickle he was in. Um, but I don't, but I, you know, they watched the movie, they loved it, Omar loved it, and the Bisbees loved it, and you know, they all they all felt like it was it was great. So and, you know, the, I, I think that in real life the that the orphanage is not so blue, you know. So <clears throat> I made it, I made everything a lot bluer. Uh, which by the way, it was it wasn't called Blue Miracle, it was originally called On the Line. And then oh, when Netflix nice. changed it to Blue Miracle, I was like, oh shit, maybe we made it too blue, you know, I don't know. So um so I don't know if I would have made it so blue if it was originally called Blue Miracle, but yeah. So wait, so wait, before Netflix changed the title, you were already immersed in this blue motif. That was your aesthetic design, your yeah. choice. It was all variations of blue. And then Netflix said, mm, blue miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's right. what happened. They said so they, uh, 
so they they made the, they made the production design seem a little more on the nose than I had intended it to be, but uh, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me <laughs> tell me about the blue. What what was the what was the decision there? And at what point did that kind of enter your mind as a way to help tell this story? You know, I don't, I, I don't know. It, for some reason, like it, it felt it felt kind of natural with the fact, like with the, all the ocean imagery and the blue marlin and all that, it, it felt natural to keep things in that color space. I did use a rough, with my production designer and with the cinematographer, we did have like kind of a rough motif of sort of color coding Omar's kind of ethical journey or moral journey. So, so like, so whenever it felt like, he, whenever maybe he felt like he was more on the right path and things, things got bluer. And whenever things got started to get sketchier, they would start to veer into purple and then eventually to red. Mm. So you can kind of see that with like uh, when his his buddy, the drug dealing buddy, comes from out of town. Like suddenly, it's like he has a red truck and they go to a red bar and then you know Captain Wade shows up in the middle of the night with the proposal. They're all lit by red taillights. And um, so we kind of use that scale of blue, purple, red uh, in in a way that in our brains help us orient ourselves for some reason, but it doesn't, I doesn't, you don't really pick up on that. Most people just pick up on the blue aspect of everything. But but for me, it was sort of just about like the the water was a thing. I, maybe in earlier iterations of the draft, like Omar was more scared of the water. He was he had more of a phobia based on his trauma as a child. That didn't in the cut, that stuff kind of didn't quite make it. We kind of weeded some of that stuff out. But uh but so the so the blue was just sort of this thing that was like this past that was kind of always the oceans always coming the waters always flooding in it was always, it was so it, it kind of felt natural but uh, but I didn't it wasn't something I just I just remember just telling everybody like don't send me yellow shirts to set just don't do it you know and it was just that sort of you know and then little by little everything was just blue so it was funny because watching it a second time I was like okay blue bandana <laughs> blue pickup truck. Yeah. Blue lid on the Tupperware, but you know now <laughs> we, Tweety's got a blue crayon. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, you know what's the funny? That's the funny thing is like once you once you put that into people's heads, and then then they they just start. And, and, but what's weird about it is it, that's only that's only weird for this genre because if you look at like a Wes Anderson movie that's all pink or all yellow, or if you look at Amelie, it's all green or so. There's there's lots of genres where this is just normal, but for like it's it's not normal for like the the true story family drama thing. Uh, um, so, so it's funny because it's, it's really something that's more in, in it, 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 it's, it's just, it's, I think it's just unusual for this particular kind of movie, but, yeah. um, <clears throat> but it is a lot of blue and we pushed it cooler in, in the color and color. We, we, we just kind of kept edging it cooler and cooler and cooler and, and the blues just kept popping and we were like, oh, okay, let's try it. You know, let's go for it. So it works. To circle back to um, the kind of the based on the true story aspect of it, you you interviewed Omar before or during the the story crafting process. Do, did he watch the movie? Did you talk to him afterwards? Do you know what he thought of the choices that you made to kind of draw out the essence of his character while not necessarily hewing to the reality of his lived experience? I, I didn't talk to him directly. I talked to um, I talked to Donna, a woman who ran it, who like founded it with him. She said he loved it. Is I. I I don't know. I like I, the 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 liberties I took with him. I don't think he would mind. I mean, because the, the, like for example, the the drug dealing past that was true. So there wasn't like I didn't do anything in particular. To make I didn't do anything to meet him look bad. It was the I did. I would be curious. Yeah, I guess I would be curious to know how he felt about me giving him some doubts because I because that was the whole thing is like I gave him doubts about how this is going to turn out. Doubts about a lot of things, and he didn't. He never gave me any sense in real life that he had any doubts. I think everybody does have doubts, and you know, to a certain degree, but. But his his operating personality is, is faith, you know. Um, so so I don't know. He, he I haven't gotten any nasty emails about it, so we'll see. I think what's really interesting about the character Pop Omar, especially, I, I think it's a, a wholly relatable character, especially the situations he gets into, especially for parents, because I think in general there is kind of this maybe natural instinct for parents to kind of uh put up a positive front for their children you know and and maybe not show them like all the struggles of the world but keep them internal you know and and I, there's there's that in this movie like um uh, you know jimmy gonzalez plays it really well just like uh holding back you're showing some of his past that he's kind of 
that's surfacing and he's kind of still dealing with that that comes into his consciousness but at the same time he's got uh, the pressure of keeping providing for these kids and so that that feels like wholly relatable as as a parent um and, and so you know i i think that that definitely for if if you want to put a genre stamp on it for a family movie um i think that that is something it's cool to see like a parent uh deal with that but also there's that hook at the kind of in the third act where he's struggling with honesty and making his own decisions yeah um now obviously i i would assume that that kind of third act hook of you know the uh what what um what the uh captain played by dennis quaid is presenting to him yeah no, that, no, that, that, that challenge great. yeah that that was a challenge that you brought into the drama of it all right yeah yeah no i, I, I invented that dilemma because because it for me well it is an interesting question which is like i think i well i think in the original i think in the original draft it was like a debate about whether or not he was going to go run some drugs like mm -hmm. whether or not he was going to go uh and i and that was interesting but it felt like it was like to me it's i to keep it in the world of the fishing this seemed and this told us more about captain wade too so it made, it made him a more around character so that's why i changed it but it but it but it's it still it was in the original draft which is like is it okay to do something unethical for ethical reason for an ethical goal and especially when kids are involved and uh you know in the end the movie seems to say that you shouldn't you know but but i but i don't think it's that simple it's not that cut and dry uh, so, so i i think it's I, I do think it's a question like I, you know, what if they had if they hadn't caught that fish, like should Omar have done should he have done that to save the orphanage? You know, it's not it's not clear. I think I I my I tend to believe that and you know it's better to do just to make ethical decisions and take accept the consequences that come with that. Um but I've never been responsible for 30 kids that might be thrown out on the street. So who you know, who knows? Like that's a just those are tough questions. Right. Now th that that particular and without spoiling yeah. anything but that third act problem involves the temptation of cheating mm -hmm. this the specifics of that situation where did you come up with that is that something that you had heard about or in just kind of exploring kind of the fishing culture like oh it'd be interesting if someone tried to do this in order to win a tournament yeah no i I thought about cheating and I was like, I, I tried to figure out how you could possibly cheat on this. And then what I found out, I found like people had done sort of similar things with like small bass and things like, in, in, you know, and, and where there, where there's huge, there are, it's actually highly illegal uh, because, because the pools of money are so big. Uh, and funny enough, they're, they're like this uh, particular tournament actually does lie detector tests at the end oh. um, because just because it's uh, because there's so much money at stake. And because, you know, you could have some other, you're out there in the middle of the ocean. So somebody, you could have 10 boats out there fishing for you and you guys decide, to, you know, whoever catches it, brings it over to your boat and you take it to the sea. So typically the way they do it is once you put, you get a fish on the line, you call it in and somebody from the tournament will come watch you reel it in. Uh, we didn't, we didn't have that, uh, we didn't have that element, but, but no, che cheating is a real, it's a real risk in these, in these uh, high dollar tournaments. So, um, so the, the particulars I invented the particulars of how these guys were going to do that, um, but it is, but it is a, a something that these tournaments take into account for sure. I wonder if nowadays with the technology they have out there and you know trying to keep the whole thing honest, if you know Bisbee or whoever's in charge has their own boats out there with drones and everything just to make sure. All right, everybody's honest. I know you mentioned the lie detector, but. Heck, they could even do a sobriety test at the end too. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, no, they, they, there are lots of ways. Yeah, drones would be a good idea. It wouldn't take much to just get a drone. I mean, yeah, if a drone, drone with a four mile radius, you can get out there pretty quick. So, uh, speaking yeah. of which, can you talk about your your drone work in this movie? I mean, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we so we did. Um, so what we did was before we shot the movie. Remember, I, I so I said that Dennis got bumped. We were supposed to shoot the movie in October of 2018. And then the movie, and then he got bumped. So what we did was we went to the, I went to the tournament with my wife and my my brother, who he who was also our VCAM operator, underwater operator, and but he flew our drones too. And so I went out to Cabo with him, and and we just got all of this footage of the actual tournament, all the boats taking off, and all that stuff. And uh, and then we just sat on that until we got to make the movie eight months later or whatever it was. Uh, and and so then it was a matter of looking at the drone footage and then creating all the close ups 
of the kids in the boat and Captain Wade in the boat and, and splicing them together and trying to make sure you do it at the kind of same time of day and all that. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, the stuff you can do with drones, I mean, these drones are like, I mean, that, that, it was a nice, that's a nice drone, but it's not like it, it, you could buy it for 14 grand or something and, and get footage that used to be crazy. I mean, it used to have to have helicopters and, and even with helicopters, you couldn't, we're flying down like eight feet off the, above the water and things like, so, um, so that really helped open up like the whole world of this movie and make it feel a lot bigger than a bigger budget than it actually was. Like we would never would have been able to get 200 sure. taken off. So. Yeah. Yeah. so when you were filming uh, out on the, the ocean scenes, was that actually out on location in the ocean or were there, was there a, was it a tank? Cause it all looks pretty real. I'm thinking specifically you've got all those kids out there plus the crew and there's even a scene where a couple of the kids go overboard during a fight which was you know pretty shocking to see because it looked very convincing uh was this all you know on location or how did you how did you pull that off well the majority of it was shot in in uh in a tank it's, it's a, in the dominican republic and so that's that was a big reason why we went there so they have that you know big infinity tank the football size infinity tank, whatever that. So, so the idea is, it, it, it when you're looking out towards the ocean, the edge of it is an infinity tank. It's supposed, it's supposed to blend in with the horizon, and it does most of it. In practice, though, like I shoot with wider lenses and probably deeper focus than than other people, maybe. So, so I, so what we ended up having to do was we, we shot on that tank for two weeks, and so there was for we had to kind of uh, in VFX we had to clean up the horizon line to blend the. Uh, the tank into the rest of the ocean so it was sort of a matter of extending the tank um it was it it was a godsend with a bunch of kids because we could control everything uh we could set up lights and things like that the, you, the difficulty you know is that you can only look one direction so whenever i couldn't really pan left or right mm -hmm. uh because you see a parking lot or you'd see the trees and so 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 that actually and we shot that stuff first so that's sort of created a style an aesthetic that i had to work with which is just like i have to like look this way and then i have to cut and then i have to rotate the boat and then i and then i can get the reverse and then i have to rotate the boat and i can get this other guy and rotate the boat so mm. so my style i mean i like you know from the vessel my style is a lot more floating and fluid and and following people and things but since we started off, off there and i couldn't do any of that i had kind of I, like i didn't want it to be as soon as we got out of the water suddenly I'm you know Malik again and is pointing you know so so I had so I had to figure out I had to kind of do a little bit more control cell just to make it seamless um we did one day out on the ocean just to get the like the takeoff scene when when the kids are cheering and all that stuff so so for that we went out to the actual ocean like you know a half a mile away from the shore and we had three boats I think and so we just kept doing passes of, and then we take the three boats, we move to the other side, and we passes, and and we just had to keep them going in circles. So so it looked like we had a hundred boats with us. Um, but but that day, I mean, kids, you know, the kids are puking, camera department's getting sick, and it was like, it was, it's not fun. So so I so even though the tank is limiting in some ways, like that just we couldn't have done it on the ocean. It would have been too difficult. The boat never stays in place, and uh, everybody gets sick. So. Uh, so yeah, it was mostly tank. A little green screen work, a little bit. I'm curious. I mean, you're you're doing things that you know Spielberg did early on, like like you mentioned. You mentioned Spielberg earlier, like you know working with kids and working on the water. Um, and and I'm wondering, uh, the kids have such great camaraderie. How much time did you give them to hang out and spend time with each other before cameras started rolling? Yeah, we did. Uh, they got there um i think two two weeks maybe two weeks early and so what we did was i did a table read with them of the whole script to make sure they understood everything um and then the rest of the time i was like just go to the beach like you guys go hang out and, and cool. just have a, good, have a good time so they were they, they became buddies especially um you know like gecko and hollywood the, the those two characters right that, Nathan and Anthony, those guys were just became inseparable as, and you can kind of tell on screen too, you know, they're just all very, they're very close. So that helped a lot. And then we kind of, um, Miguel who played Moco, he was, he's actually older. He, he, he plays younger, but he was 19 at the time. So he, he was, he was, he would, I would have him 
take the kids and like if I felt like a kid was working have one of the kids was having trouble with the scene or something I'd, uh, I'd have him go work with them in their hotels and stuff and then the next day the kid would come back and he would he had it, you know so they, those kids are pros man like you know Anthony who played Gecko he was the voice of Coco and uh, oh. and Nathan is uh who played Hollywood is like in my, our nanny recognized them was excited from some Disney shows or maybe Nick Lode, I don't know like they, these kids are they're all pros and they all knew all their lines and they you know um, the biggest thing about them was that I, I tried, this is a movie that, you know, you, you, this subject matter could be pretty dreary, you know, it's like orphans and talking about dead fathers and all that stuff. So, so I made a conscious effort to try to cast all kids that just sort of had like a natural charisma and optimism and nothing mopey about them and stuff, especially you, you can tell that really with Tweety, the youngest kid, and that kid, like you just can't help, he just makes everybody smile all the time, you know, even just in real life. And so even when he's talking about his mom leaving him and stuff, he, he makes it enjoyable you know um so that, that was i think casting the only challenge with the kids was that they'd have to go to school all the time like kids <laughs> are like god it was like we had to go oh my god like what is this we had, we had like six hours a day with them or something and so i had to on top of all the challenges of having to rotate the boat and all those things then i also had to deal with the fact that i only had them six hours so i would shoot I have to edit in my head and shoot their angles and then know that if once I flipped around, I would have to use doubles to shoot over the shoulders of 40 year old men, essentially they're dressed like my kids. And, and I remember I was really, really like, they would like, you know, they were had like stubble. I'm like, can somebody please, can he shave? Like, like this is crazy. That's so, so it was a really, and so, so, and they were great. I mean, the, the, everybody was very nice and everything, but it was, it was a very challenging thing to have to, it, it, it was like, Oh, I wish I would have gotten. No, the kid's gone. Like he's I'm, he's done for the day. So, uh, so that's it. You know. And so th that was really scheduling is the main challenge that I found with kids. Um, obviously, there's the difficulty of you know the Tweety's Stephen who played Tweety's very young. So you're having to, you know, you're, you're, there's some yeah, that's Spielberg stuff. Where you're just right off camera and you're trying to just get them to imitate you and that sort of thing. Um, and so, so that's fine. That was fun. But really, is the schedule. The schedule is just. We only had 24 days to shoot this movie. It was 20, you know, on the water. Wow. So it was, it was tough, man. It was, it was, uh, it wasn't Jaws tough, but it was, <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was, it had, it had challenges. Yeah. So you, you started shooting, um, you, you said you started shooting in the tank. Like that was the first stuff you shot, right? I mean, besides the drone stuff. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, like how many days, you 24 total, how many days in the tank? 12 days in the tank. Wow. So half, half, half the movie was just shooting in tank and then <clears throat> and then the rest was i mean once we got a tank it was like man it felt so easy it was like i can pan and tilt and i can you know we can just walk around and we, you know everything was just so much easier but, um and, and we had already gotten in our rhythm you know with the actors and everything um but yeah, the other the first those first two weeks were uh it was it was challenging i mean like that rain day you talked about the day when the kids fall off the water that um that whole sequence with the rain and the stunts and everything we shot that all in one day and i had the flu that day like the flu went through our oh. whole crew and that was the one wow. day i happened to have the flu so i was like i can i'm trying to scream over the sound of the rain machine and i can barely stand up and it was just like and it, we're just so tired so um so 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 some of the stuff was like you know like i said you know fitz Caraldo was harder or whatever but but this is you know but but like you know this had it was this had challenges for, for sure. It was, um, shooting on the water is not not a joke. Let me ask you about that. Um, the flu thing. You're the director. You're steering this ship, pun intended, and you've got the flu. Is it just the fact that everyone's got their eyes on you and you've got a schedule and a budget that keeps you going? Or is there, do you have some other kind of reserves that, that you have to, to get? Is there any possibility you could have just said, I need a day to sleep this thing off. Well, the probably it doesn't seem like that's an option because the thing is you have things like like Dennis had a set schedule and these guys always have a hard out of some sort or whatever. So it's like each one of these days costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so short of me getting hit by a bus, like mm -hmm. it was not even suggested. Nobody even asked me if I needed to not shoot that day. Like it was like the it was like, please, there's like, you can just feel it. Like everyone's like, please don't say that you can't shoot today. And so you just kind of have, you just have to do it. You just have the choice. This is too much on the line. And, 
and everything would have to get compressed. Then if I lose it one of those tank days and everything is compressed in the next few days and I'm just screw up so many things. So, I mean, we were just holding on by our fingernails. I always made my days. I think it was one day that I didn't, that we had to bump like a tiny thing over, but, uh, but it's just like, you just have to make your days. I think that's like, that's like the number one thing that gets like directors fired from movies. It's like, they didn't, they weren't finishing their days. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's the most amazing footage. It's like, they were finishing their days. So they're, they're gone or whatever. So. so do you have it when you get into those situations, I don't know how often that happens, but do you have some kind of a, is it a song or a motivational kind of moment from your life? That, like, do you play eye of the tiger in your head to say, I'm, this, I'm going to rally. I'm going to do it. Flu be damned. Just keep swimming. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it is, man, about making a movie where it, like, I think, I think it is maybe just so many people counting on you. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it is because like when I'm writing, I can't go more than two hours without taking a nap. But when I'm, when I have, a hundred people waiting on me and everybody's scheduled this thing and everybody's ready to go and stuff. I don't know, man. You just kind of, you just have to do it. And, 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 you know, you hear stories about people, you know, World War II, there's like soldiers who are like falling asleep as they march and stuff, you know, across mm -hmm. France. And so, so it's like people can do much harder things than shoot a, a, a family fishing movie in the Dominican Republic. And, and so it's just like, it, it seems like it's too hard, but, but like in the end, I don't know. Somehow you just, you just, I, I, it, directing seems to give me a lot more energy than anything else in my life. Like, um, I don't know, I don't know why, but when I'm, when I got the camera there and the actors and everything, it's just like, I, I somehow I get, I have much more energy than I do normally. Uh, I don't know what that is, but. When you work with actors, mm -hmm. um, you have, a, you're working with, a variety of different actors here you know some are younger some have been around uh, for a long time now with the vessel you know you the most recognizable actor is martin sheen of course and he's a veteran uh but you have you know great character actor like bruce mcgill you know raymond cruz uh you know dana wheeler nicholson and uh jimmy and of course dennis quaid are you um are you gleaning and learning from them just as much as, you know, you're learning about the craft of, you know, making Blue Miracle? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, in some ways, in some ways, all those people are easier because they're great. They're really good actors. So they give you things that you don't expect mm. in a good way, you know, so that, so in that sense, in other ways, they're, they can be more difficult, obviously. You know, I mean, in some like, I can tell a kid, stand there, here's, there's your piece of tape or whatever. With Dennis, it's like, how do you think, how do you feel about standing here? This, you know what I mean? And so it's like, and so, so, so in that sense, there, there's kind of pros and cons. Uh, there's not, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just lucky to have, people like Martin or Dennis for sure. But, 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 but it's a, it's a negotiation like that. They're their own creative force as well. So everybody else, everybody else in the team, whatever, like you're negotiating, but you're still like, you're in charge and you're, you don't have time. Like people don't have time for arguments and stuff, but a, a certain caliber of actor, they bring, they, it, it's like a, come on, you know, you're, you're, I told Dennis, like he, you know, he always tells everybody he's the, he's the easiest guy to work with in Hollywood. And I was like, dude, you're not, you're not easy. Like I was like, you're, I told him, I was like, you're, you're like, you're like, like a high level rodeo bull, you know, like if you can hold on, it's a great show, but you're not easy. And he's like, he's like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, that's like, that's so, like somebody saying I'm the most humble guy out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he's like. And he's, so, but you know, what's interesting though, like those guys, so like Dennis also, he, you know, he didn't, he didn't, he was fine to like make changes on me dialogue and things like he would just ask me and I, I don't care he's like you mind if I just write it like, sure yeah he would cross out lines and look uh and it was always he had a really good instinct he, that a lot of times it, it always made sense to me whether he changed um usually it was making things more concise but like you know there was one time for example where he uh here's that scene there's a scene where Omar goes in and confronts him and you know uh, and he says uh and and what Captain Wade says is, if you want to teach those kids to be losers their whole life, that's your problem. I don't want any part of it. Right. Well, in my version, in my script, I think, I think I said something about like if you want to have make them have low expectations or something, uh, that's your problem. I, I don't remember what my line was. 
he changed it to if you want to, if you want to teach them to be losers. And, you know, it was interesting because when he said that, I, when I wrote the script, I, I had set up a debate and I thought like Omar's worldview was wholly correct, was all right. And Captain Wade's view was all wrong. And over the course of the movie, you realize that Omar's right. But when he said that, that, you know, Jim, you know, Captain Wade, uh, Omar is trying to lower the expectations of these kids and keep them realistic and just have a good time and just focus on the experience. And then when Dennis said that, I realized that Omar is me. He's expressing my worldviews. And I think that, I think that after, you know, I think that after I made the vessel, I had such high expectations for what it would maybe do and maybe for my career or kind of doors would open or things like that. And then it was the most meaningful experience I ever had when I was making it. And then it didn't pan out exactly how I thought it would. And so then I, I, I realized when Dennis said that I, I had inadvertently taught myself to just try to enjoy the process, but don't worry about the outcome and don't really. And I realized I wasn't, it's like, I wasn't really aiming for the fish anymore. I wasn't really, I wasn't aiming for the trophy. You know, I was just, mm. it was like some, I, I had somehow I had like kind of convinced myself that that's not even worth a goal that's worth aspiring to or something and i and so it really struck me it's like so i actually like so that's the thing about you know a gr these great actors and martin's the same way like they're thoughtful people like they actually have like they're 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 deep human beings and so it was i don't know if i learned something it, it, the thing that struck me is, that is not that i learned something about filmmaking is that i learned something about myself as a person <laughs> from dennis quaid you know and 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 i think that that's like that's sort of a function of like, I like when I'm, when I write a movie, I take like something that I'm kind of struggling with an idea that I'm not totally sure about. And I kind of make my characters all say different, different parts of the argument and kind of see how it, how it plays out. It's sort of my way to figure out the world, I guess. And so if you do that, you sort of inevitably along the way, learn things about yourself um, because it's just a little, a little experiment with your own ideas. So, so yeah, that was, that was a, that was a powerful, that was a powerful moment for me, and I think, I think it kind of affects maybe how I, yeah, kind of how I approach things moving forward. Oh, wow. um, I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned Terrence Malick earlier, and I know you you work with him, and uh, you know there seem to be sort of influences in in your own work. What was uh, what did you learn from him that that you that struck you as being the most significant in terms of what you, uh, expressing yourself in your own artistic vision? Well, I started. Yeah, I started. I met Terry as an intern. My wife started uh, interning, and then she became like the, the post production coordinator and his personal assistant on the Tree of Life. And then I was an editing intern on Tree of Life, and then I kind of started shooting. Uh, yeah, he asked me to come like I was just a kid like I would come shoot for free like natural history I, I bought one of the, the the original red one cameras it was like kind of the first 4k cameras um, and so like I had a real basic package but so he invited me to go shoot like little things um, with Doug Trumbull who did it was a VFX supervisor oh, wow. and Blade Runner and yeah and all that. so I was just a kid you know I'm 25 years old sitting there with, and Doug's over there doing his crazy stuff and they have all these big contraptions the shooting cream dairy creamer down fish tanks and whatever and uh so i was there i would i would set up my camera and i would point at whatever they told me to and then i would push record and it was like a galaxy would come out of this pipe it was really weird and uh so that's how i got initially involved with that stuff and i think i had no idea what the hell this movie was about i read the script and i was just like the only thing i knew was that he didn't care about what people thought about this movie now it's like he it felt like he was he was writing something he wanted people to study 100 years from now or 500 years from now, or, or maybe he didn't even care if they said it. He was just like, it was like his own personal spiritual exploration of some sort. So I, didn't know, about, I didn't know. Are you talking about Tree of Life or Tree of Life? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember reading the script and I just didn't, I just couldn't wrap my mind around what this would even look like. I didn't have any sense. And, uh, and so then when, you know, I, I do, you know, I, so Terry expanded, he expanded what I thought was possible to explore with a movie, like the kind of ideas. You could explore uh, was just like the idea that a movie could could be more akin to like a symphony or something is is I, I had never occurred to me uh, even though there's people you know obviously there's other there's uh, other filmmakers who've done that and, you know Tarkovsky or whatever you know but but this was me meeting somebody who's doing that and it was 
uh, it kind of it was kind of nuts. And the guy, the, the main character from Fight Club, is standing there, you know, doing it. And you know, it's, it's like it's like it was just a weird thing. It's like this guy's able to do this in in, in this modern world. I'm just, um, but you know, I think the thing I, I think the thing that he influenced me the most was like, so when I was doing that VFX stuff. I remember I was, I was, he was walking around, I was trying to do, I was, I was with the other interns trying to imitate like kind of the complex stuff that Doug Trump was doing with horrible results. And Terry, he, he, he called me over and he saw like a bucket of dry ice and he was like, oh, Julio, look at the, look at the Dow in this. Like, look, you should film this. There's a, this bucket of dry ice. It was like this white smoke that's just sort of floating on the surface. And I looked at it and I was like, like, okay, like, yeah, sure, Terry, give us a few minutes. We'll, we'll shoot. So, so, so he left and I, 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 created this big contraption that was sort of what Doug Trumbull was doing. It was like a cone that I would like pour the smoke down it and it would fall over the lens and all this, whatever. And I was trying to do, I was in the middle of trying to do that. And, and, and Terry was like, no, 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 I think you should just, you should just fill in the bucket. I'm like, yeah, okay. So after, after like two hours of failing at trying to do the complicated thing, I finally just did what he said. I put a light bulb underneath that smoke and I just pointed at the, at that smoke. And it was like kind of magic. And, and, and that smoke is, you know, that's in, the movie and yeah, that's in voyage of time it's just it's just stuff into the primordial it's just a slow shot uh there's a bunch of little things i did like that like just little bubbles he told me just film bubbles in a so i got like the face of a clock and just film little bubbles and those are like in the tree of life you know and and what i realized was that he had a he had a really keen eye for just being open to little details that have some sort of energy or some sort of meaningful life force to them um and he doesn't force stuff like terry doesn't force anything he just sort of he if if something interest it doesn't matter if brad pitt's standing there like if the butterfly is over there he's going to go over there and brad pitt's gonna have to wait and and that's how that's how you end up getting that fluid so like a collection of amazing little magical moments so i i i used that approach as much as possible on the vessel but what I realized when I was on the vessel was I still had kind of a plot. Like I still had like some people would walk out this front door and then they, so then you had to cut to them coming out the front door. You know, so I still had things I had to get across. Uh, it, it wasn't quite like the tone poem, you know, that, that true of life is. So, but then on this, I still brought, I still looked for opportunities to infuse the movie, at least with some imagery that gave you a sense of, so then I, instead of the entire movie being like that, I, I was able to just create moments they give you a sense of Omar's inner life, at least his inner psychology, that there's a spiritual struggle that he's, he's, he's fighting with. Um, so, so in that sense, I, I did, I, I tried to bring that over as much as I can, but you know, the limitations of that genre are just too much. You know, you can't just, I can't just go chase the seagulls or whatever. I just can't do it. So, <laughs> but, but I do, but he is still sort of like that. He's that, that kind of North star of, of, of pure artistic uh, pursuit that is always kind of calling to you. You're like, oh, okay, I need to get, yeah, I need to, I need, I, I'll get back to you as soon as I get this kid picking off the side of this boat real quick. So, you know, so yeah, no, Terry's amazing. He's a, yeah, he's a, he's a force of nature for sure. And and he's around Austin, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where I met, yeah. that's where we met him, yeah. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, did real quick because uh, you know Martin uh, Martin Sheen famously uh, worked with him in uh, Badlands. Did he have any stories while you guys were working on the vessel about that, or was it all just about the the current project? Yeah, you know it's funny because the the thing about Martin was that he has he has like 150 or 200 IMDb credits or something. So he just has stories about like everything, man. Like <laughs> I, I mean with, with We'd be between takes and he'd be like trying to tell me like some story about, you know, Bob Dylan or Marlon Brando or something. And I have to like, I'm like, Martin, I'm, the sun's setting. I you don't know how bad I want to hear this story, but like, I'm about to lose my life. And he's like, oh, okay. All right. And he's like, so he just had like, he talks about screwing with Scorsese on The Departed and Coppola and it just goes on and on and on. And now you're just like, so, so, so funny enough. So, so, so even though Terry, even though Terry is such a huge part of my life, and he is very good friends with Mark. Terry's the reason Martin said yes. Like Terry sent the script to Martin, and that's why he, he did the movie. But but Martin just, I mean, it, the, any of his Terry stories were just like buried in a lifetime of ridiculous stories. I mean, it's just the guy, and he works. He makes like a, two movies a year or something for fifty years. Like it never stops. So um, I know we're 
cutting close on time, but I, I finally want to I want to ask about uh, the big difference between these two movies. I think uh, I mean there are a lot of differences, but the big difference is who's watching it. So right. now with Netflix, anybody can watch it. With mm-hmm. with the vessel when it came out here in Chicago, I was so frustrated because I love that movie and it was only in one theater. Yeah. And uh, so now <clears throat> I could tell I could tell anybody go go check out Blue Miracle. Um, what is that like for you? Well, it's a it's kind of a weird feeling because the vessel, like I cared so much about the, every single frame of the vessel. And so, so, so since nobody really got to see it, I mean, some people did, but you know, I, to your point, yes, most effectively nobody saw it. Uh, uh, and, and so that was not fun because, you, you know, this is a, 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 as art is personal, but it's also, related to how people interpret it and it's a feedback loop you know that it, it's important the way you want people to experience it as well and it's yeah. too, it's too expensive of an art form for nobody to see it and so uh so i guess knowing that it's on 200 million accounts or whatever 300 million accounts is better um and i already I, millions of people have seen it uh blue mirror i mean um and that's a that's a function. It's partly a function of being on Netflix, and but it's largely a function of the kind of movie it is. Because uh, even even if the vessel were on Netflix, it wouldn't get the millions and millions of views. So it's a uh, so it's a it's a it's a weird you know it's a weird line that I think every artist has to kind of decide. It, you're you're cali- you have to calibrate. It's like the the, the more ambiguous an art house things get, the, the the numbers just drop off pretty precipitously, and, sure. and it's more simplistic it gets. Um, the more numbers you get. So I would say that what like the, 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 the optimistic side of me likes to think that the, the big numbers are an indication that I did something right, but there's also, you know, I'm sure the emoji movie got a lot of views. So, so I also, I'm also kind of the fact that like views in and of itself are not, they're not the end all be all. It's not, I'm glad that people are seeing it. And I'm, and, and not just that people see it because I, I'm actually getting like an, a, a, an influx of emails and messages and from people just like, thank you so much. This is the kind of movie I needed this year. And I, I'm so glad that people are, somebody's actually making this kind of content and things I can see with my family. So it actually seems to mean something to people. So that's, so that's good. Like it, it's not just, it's not just like a bunch of a uh, whole billion people saw something that's completely meaningless. Um, so, so in that sense, it's satisfying. I, I think I would, I think, I, like I said, I think I'm going to, I want to calibrate. I, I, I think there's a sweet spot in there where you can still have, you can have quite a few views with something that has maybe more of my, you know, can maybe dig a little deeper and have some more, a little bit more ambiguity. Uh, and, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out going forward. But, but, for, but I will say it's, Short answer, shallow answer is it's better that millions of people saw this than nobody seeing the last thing. This it's definitely it's practically speaking it's better, uh, and, and uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's good. And people appreciate the work you do because you know, it's it's hard, man. This is, it's a lot. It's a lot. Of, it's a real grind to do something, and then it's just a, a blue ray on your shelf or whatever. You know, I so. can imagine. <clears throat> Well, I mean, the I guess the positive side is you do have a success in this film, which will hopefully open up some of those avenues as you figure out what your next creative step, what you want it to be. This may allow that to happen. So you'll get closer to that sweet spot of commercial success with the uh, the sort of the, the depth and, and feeling that you're that you're looking for in the kind of movies that you'd want to watch. Yeah. And funny enough, I'm actually getting now I'm getting calls. I'm getting calls from people who they heard about me because of Blue Miracle, but they're calling me because they saw the vessel and they're, they're like wanting to bring me weird magical realism art house movies. And so, you know, so it's like, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. You're, you're right. It's like, I, I somehow I've like, I've got, it's given me the credibility that I, I'm in the club. I can be relied on. I can deliver a product that's, that is taken seriously by a major studio. Uh, so it, it does, it totally changes the conversation. Now. I think I'm kind of hoping I, there's some filmmakers like, Alfonso Cuaron or Steven Soderbergh or, you know, maybe the Coen brothers. Or There's guys who can kind of like, they can bounce around all kinds of genres and do Gravity and Ito Matamien and, uh, you know, Harry Potter and Roma. And, you know, so, so I think 
that's kind of where I think I'm, I'm, that's kind of where I th- I'm, may end up falling where it's like sometimes I might want to make a movie that my, my kids will like and sometimes I just want I want to make something that my grandma just might not like yeah <laughs> well thank you very much for for hanging out and, and talking with us it's been a very fun and, and enlightening conversation um you know David and I both are, are huge fans of uh, the vessel and blue miracle so this has been a real treat and we hope that uh whatever your next step is that maybe we can talk to you about that too yeah, I'd love to, man. That'd be great. I appreciate you guys taking the time. Yeah, I, it was. It's great to talk to you. I know we've kept in touch. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. been a while, but uh, I'm glad that we were able to make this happen tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. All right, man. Well, take care. And I'll uh, oh, <laughs> knock over my mic. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll catch you later. All Stay right. cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.